Good afternoon. Namaste. Welcome. As we begin with light, I would like to invite Ambassador Sudhakar Dalila, Deputy Chief of Mission of the Embassy of India, and his wife, Mrs. Namrita Dalila, Srimati Kamala, the President of the Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Foundation, to come forward to offer a light at the lamp. Amrita Shankar offers a Bharat Natyam dance invocation to a Stuti verse of Tosidas, Sri Ramachandra Kripalu. It was written in the 16th century in a mix of Sanskrit and Avadi languages. It praises the qualities of Lord Rama, who removes sorrow fear, and weakness of mind. His beauty is illumined as the blooming lotus. He is the embodiment of sacredness. O oh mind, sing praises of Lord Rama, the destroyer of ignorance, the source of endless joy, adorned with the crown on his head and tilaka on his forehead. Thus says Sri Tulsidas, O Sri Ram, come dwell in the lotus of my heart. Remove all unrighteousness thoughts and grant me salvation. Thank you. 
It's also important to watch the movement of the things. Beautifully orchestrated. I greet you, all of you who are present especially, and those of you who are observing through Zoom, is that it, streaming? Marvelous, marvelous that that can be done. But I want to talk especially to those of you who are here first. Uh, because I know at this point, it's not easy to come out for many of you. We have been observing Gandhi Jayanti for 50 years, 
at least. 45 years, 45 years since Gandhi Center was built and established. Some of you have been here even from those days. And I, I bow to you, I cannot thank you enough. You are my kin and you know what it is to support with your life. When I walked to the door this morning, this afternoon, sorry, this afternoon, I came by, the, of course, the lamps that will be lit outside, a tradition that you all have brought. Uh, everything that you see here prepared, you have brought. From the lamp itself, the light, of course, we all bring from our hearts and minds, all of the art, the dance, the music, the tradition of singing, all of the beauty that we bring to this day is something that bespeaks the tradition of this Gandhi Center. I have the seemingly exalted or uh, important position of being president of the Gandhi Foundation, but let me assure you, and I say so with uh, utmost appreciation and sincerity, that the credit for everything that you see here today goes to Karunaji. It is her leadership and her uh, character, her creative spirit, her optimism, everything which is building this institution these days, and I'm forever thankful and proud, both. I have to be personal, and I, I get to be. That's, that's why I can welcome you. I get to be a little personal that we have been through this for so many years, and I want you to consider the changes that these years have brought to our countries, to cultures, to families, to your families and ours, to each other, to careers, to so many aspects of life. But the thing that remains steady is what we are here for. And I'm going to start with a question. I'd like you to consider this question while we are talking for a few moments. Because it is a question that was posed to Gandhiji. And I'll give you his response, but I'd rather just pose the question to you to start with, and that is, is the world getting better or worse? Ha. Huh. Now, you'd think an, an optimist would answer in one way, a pessimist in another, a realist in another. But we're here in a way because we know the way Gandhiji would answer that question. But I'm holding off on that for a moment. Just think about it. When I consider what we are here to share this afternoon, it's what you bring that shows your belief, what you believe. It is the way you think about the character, the confession of inner strengths and weaknesses of Gandhiji's, his, uh, the powers that guided him, that you take on and draw into yourself and your own life. It's for that that we are here. And because you came to prepare this program, you are able to bring to it and experience something that no one can who's just watching it on a Zoom, I must say. There are its limitations. What are those limitations? Return waves of affection, recognition, so much that we know and understand, and we're here for this wonderful human need to show respect and to honor those who walk ahead of us on the path of life. 
So we are here, and you have brought it with your goodness. The atmosphere that we enjoy, the encouragement, so much that we find worthy of this moment. So now I'll give you Gandhiji's response to that question. Again, I pose the question. Is the world getting better or worse? And here's his answer. So long as I believe in the benevolence of God, I must believe the world is getting better, even though I see evidence to the contrary. You see? But it's that belief that we serve. And the greater part of believe, you know that word is very interesting, believe. There's live in there. The greater part of belief and believing is to live. Curiously, evil is live backwards. No. To live. So we're here not only to live for this next short time that we have to share together, but uh, to enjoy. And with all my heart, I, not only do I welcome you, I thank you so very, very much for your continued support of and encouragement of all of us at the Gandhi Center. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I have the, the wonderful uh, privilege of introducing our next part of the program. By the way, you know, we always have had the uh, Harita Mardo or Vaishnava Janato and ending with the Ramdun. Today, the Ramdun ending will be most beautifully rendered on sitar by Alif Laila. So this, the note that I have for Haritum Haro uh, are rather lengthy. We've heard them before. It bears listening to again because that's such an astonishing story. At one time, Ms. Subalakshmi visited Gandhiji in Delhi and she sang the Ram Dun for him. Later, he expressed his wish to hear her sing Haritum Haro. She answered that she wasn't familiar with the song, and she suggested another singer who could sing instead of herself. But Gandhiji, in turn, replied that he would rather hear her speak the words than hear someone else singing it. So, of course, she felt very obliged to learn the song. She recorded it. All India Radio recorded it in Chennai, and it was sent for him to listen to on his 72nd birthday, I think it was. Uh, 78th birthday, I'm sorry, uh, 1947. A few months later, when he was assassinated, it was, uh, they played Shubalakshmi's recording of Haritum Haro on the radio repeatedly, and it was said that upon hearing it, she fainted. The song, Gandhiji himself translated. I'm not going to read the translation, but I want to give you the, the gist of it. It has to do with whenever one feels helpless, abandoned, defeated, or weak, or tired of trying, He should take the name of God, and that man must rely only on God when his own resources are spent. Invoke the name of God, and the grace of God descends. Supriya, we want only your voice singing this beautiful. <laughs> 
Thank you so very much.
and sets a tone. I feel so blessed and so privileged not only to be here in your presence, but I'm so grateful to have our friends, Ambassador Sudhakar Dalila and his family back in Washington. You know, his postings have taken him to Brazil and Switzerland and Israel, Bangladesh. And there was a time recently when he was here in Washington, D.C., previous to this posting, now as Deputy Chief of Mission, and recently in Chicago as Council General. But I, I feel so, so grateful that you are here in Washington with your wife, Namrata, and your daughter, Aditi. And I think that everyone knows you're here now. They're, all the calls are coming. <laughs> but when you first arrived in Washington in the midst of this pandemic, we didn't know when we would get to resume our in-person gatherings. So for me, it's very special to welcome you here today for Gandhi Jayanti with the Gandhi Memorial Center and all our friends and family. It is indeed an honor, sir. Welcome. Director of the Gandhi Memorial Center, Karunaji, President of the Foundation and Founding Director of the Center, Kamlaji, and all our friends who have gathered here this evening. First of all, thank you very much, Karunaji, for inviting me and my wife, Namrata, uh, for this, uh, for the, to the Center for celebrating Gandhi Janti. I'm really delighted to be here with all of you. Uh, and I see many friends here to this, this evening here at the Center uh, as we celebrate and as we sort of uh, on the, on, the, on the occasion of Gandhi Jayanti. Both Namrata and I fondly remember our numerous visits to the center uh, when we were here, as you mentioned, uh, during our previous posting from 2011 to 2014. And it's really a wonderful feeling to be back in the center today. <coughs> I would like to congratulate uh, you, Karnaji, and the center for organizing this uh, special commemoration, even as we continue to deal with the global pandemic. Mahatma Gandhi said, and I noticed that this is the theme of your event today on your brochure, my life is my message. 152 years have passed since his birth and yet his life continues to inspire generations in India and across the world. His powerful message of truth and non-violence, in my view, is even more relevant today for peace, development and progress across the world. Let me touch upon uh, three key aspects of Mahatma Gandhiji's life and how they resonate in the present day in the contemporary world today. Gandhiji was a firm believer in international cooperation and in the power of collective action. He viewed the word as one family, Vasudev Kutumbukam. The importance of the word joining hand for global good could not be emphasized more now with the world facing an unprecedented and uncertain and complex pandemic. <clears throat> Gandhiji was also a strong proponent of sustainable development and conservation of environment, much before the world identified climate change as a threat to our planet. Today, there is a strong convergence on the need for sustainability and for climate action. And thirdly, Mahatma Gandhi advocated, of course, for peace and nonviolence. And all of us who have gathered this evening would agree on the importance of these ideals for development, peace, and prosperity. When we look at the India-US partnership, these aspects of Gandhian philosophy are very much discernible. We witnessed how India and the US helped each other and, the, and worked with other partners to manage the challenges posed by COVID-19. India deeply values the support extended by US administration, US Congress, private sector, and the American people 
when we were trying to cope up with the second wave of COVID infection earlier this year. India and US are working together to address climate change and have launched a new clean energy and climate partnership this year. And only last week, as Prime Minister Modi mentioned in his remark during the meeting with President Biden, the sentiment of trusteeship of the planet, which Gandhiji espoused, is going to assume more and more importance globally. Working together for the delivery of global public goods in sectors such as health, technology, education, was a key element uh, of both the India-US bilateral summit and the Quad Leader Summit, which happened last week in Washington, D.C. Gandhiji's ideals traveled across the globe and impacted and inspired leading figures in the U.S., including Martha Luther King Jr., John Lewis, and several others. As all of you know also, eminent U.S. thinkers influenced Gandhiji as well. The number of centers in U.S. celebrating the life and works of Gandhiji from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco to Atlanta is significant, and it is heartening to see initiatives such as Gandhi King Development Foundation, which will support new educational exchanges and people-to-people -people connections between the U.S. and India, focusing on the lives and ideals of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King, Jr. With these words, I once again congratulate the Gandhi Memorial Center, Karuna Ji, Kamla Ji, and all of you who have come today and watching this program through Zoom platform for organizing this event and for participation. Let us rededicate ourselves to truth and non-violence on Gandhi Janti. Thank you. Jody Dorshune, commonly known as Eklachola Ray, is a Bengali song written by the poet composer Rabindranath Tagore. It is offered today by Sudeshna Basu. She is accompanied by Debu Nayak on tabla and Jackie Rockwell on manjira. We can appreciate how deeply this song influenced Gandhiji when we understand its full meaning. If no one answers your righteous call, then go the way alone. If they are all afraid and cower mutely against the odds, then with your open heart and fearless mind speak the truth alone. If all others turn away and desert you as you cross the wilderness of pain, there in dark shadows tracks, O pilgrim, walk the thorny path softened by the blood of thy own determined will. Keep forging bravely onward and walk alone, walk alone. For if no one else holds up the light on the dark and stormy night, if on hearing you knock they close their doors, then let the thunder strike of pain ignite the love light of your heart. 
Illumine the darkness with thy love of truth and walk alone, walk alone, walk alone. Thank you. Uh, can I just mention that this translation is by Kamalaji? যদি তোর ডাক শুনে কেউ না একলা চলো রে যদি তোর ডাক শুনে কেউ তবে একলা চলো রে তবে একলা চলো একলা চলো একলা চলো একলা চলো রে তবে একলা চলো একলা চলো একলা চলো একলা চলো রে যদি তোর ডাক শুনে কেউ না
যদি তোর ডাক শুনে কেউ না আসে তবে একলা চলো রে যদি তোর ডাক শুনে কেউ না আসে তবে একলা চলো রে তবে একলা চলো একলা চলো একলা চলো একলা চলো রে তবে একলা চলো একলা চলো একলা চলো একলা চলো রে যদি তোর ডাক শুনে কেউ না আসে তবে একলা চলো রে যদি তোর ডাক শুনে কেউ না আসে তবে একলা চলো রে যদি তোর ডাক শুনে কেউ না আসে তবে একলা চলো রে That was well worth the wait for the mandira. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Nebuda and Sudeshna. You're bringing back all of the joy and love we have for this so Rabindra Sangeet and the message shared with Mahatma Gandhi. You know, I feel so very much that this is our family reunion when we have our Gandhi Jayanti observance. Absolutely. And I know, I know each and every one of you feel just the same. With the life as has been repeated throughout this observance thus far, for each of us, our life is our message. I was trying to identify where that expression, though we know its meaning, but where it originated. And it was said that it was upon visiting Bengal that Gandhiji was asked to give a message to the people of India, to which he responded, my life is my message. And of course, Gandhiji's message was ultimately one of faith in his ideal and attempting to live up to that ideal as fully as possible. And he requested us not merely to turn to his writings and speeches, but to the very actions of his life. What he wanted to communicate was observable by his daily living. His experiments with truth, that was his life message. Through every aspect of his life, whether it was spiritual, physical, mental, he continually aspired to perfect each in his continuous striving for moksha, self-liberation, self-realization. And over the course of his life, of course, his actions evolved toward the, what he hoped would be more enlightened living. And Gandhiji said that in times to come, people will not judge us by the creed we profess or the label we wear or the slogans we shout, but by our work, our industry, sacrifice, honesty, and most of all, purity of character. We often find that in the study of history, we turn to letters that were written in the personal correspondence between individuals. And these letters tell us a great deal, both about the author of the letter and the recipient. They help to paint a picture Think of the letters passed down in your own family from generation to generation. They tell a story of a different time, but also about the life and the character of the messenger. They are indeed a partial representation of the messenger. We may obtain 
a glimpse into Gandhiji's own personality, the charm, the wit, care and concern, and how lovingly he attended to his correspondence, always with a personal touch. We may reflect on his messages of health and healing, pain and happiness, in messages to the old and young, giving guidance and support to all who were striving while at the same time sharing his own joys and struggles. As he once said, I am but a poor struggling soul, yearning to be wholly good, wholly truthful, and wholly nonviolent in thought, word, and deed, but ever failing to reach the ideal which I know to be true. It is a painful climb, but the pain of it is a positive pleasure to me. Each step upwards makes me feel stronger and fit for the next. He once wrote the following message in a letter to his disciple known as Miraben, Madeline Slade, who was the daughter of a British admiral who had come to share in Gandhiji's work in India. He wrote, the impenetrable darkness that surrounds us is not a curse, but a blessing. God has given us power to see the steps in front of us, and it would be enough if heavenly light reveals that step to us. We can then sing with Newman, one step enough for me. Of course, Gandhiji often quoted from this hymn that was sung in his ashram prayer meetings, lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom, lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home, lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet, I do not ask to see the distant steen, one step enough for me. Today, our media is often without the physical record. We send digital messages. Will the message of today be able to convey a story to the generations of the future? Will we track down our carefully thought out emails and texts? Even more than a record of history, our correspondence tells a story of where we place the utmost importance, be it our faith, our ideal, health, work, relationships. The personal nature of Gandhiji's letters reflect his attention and love for friends and fellow satyagrahis. In his letters, we see his love and banter his genuine concern for people, his keen memory and attention. His letters also made clear his intense interest in diet, health, and well-being. He would often offer advice based on his own experiments within these areas. In his letters, we learn firsthand of his loving kindness, his trust in people, his judgment of character, his thoughtfulness of others, even while in the midst of great trials and tribulations and heavy responsibilities. He wrote letters from his ashrams, from prison, and while touring India. He would write even during his observance of his weekly day of silence late at night or early before dawn, never failing to respond to the genuine inquiries presented to him. We learn of the depth of his personal relationships, his consideration of the feelings and personalities of others. And we recognize his energy, will, and persistence, and his unshakable belief in the presence and power of truth. We, le we learn keenly and intimately about Gandhiji through his letters. He never failed to communicate his ideas, his hopes, and his suffering. He would reflect 
on his own health, often in response to the worry and concern of the author of letters received by him, particularly during his fasts. He would detail his response about his diet and regimen, even his weight. <laughs> and he would often advise the habit of taking long walks and taking proper care of one's health. No area of life was untouched by Gandhiji's expression, attention, and consideration. He wrote of his travels throughout India, his meetings and constructive program work, but he also wrote of his day-to-day -day living. He wrote to the children and families of the ashrams offering guidance and love. His letters would not be considered the world's best literature, he was not concerned with style, but with meaning. Writing to him was not an art, but a medium of expression. He once said, grace is the diction of poetry. After all, we may consider the poet's life to be the real poem. The collected works of Mahatma Gandhi, which you may find in our Gandhi Center library, document what he spoke and wrote day after day, year after year, beginning with the year 1884 until January 30th, 1948. This collection brings together his writings that had been scattered all over the world. In fact, India's effort to bring together these collective works of Mahatma Gandhi took about 38 years to gather and edit. They amount to 100 volumes published between 1956 and 1994. But with his voluminous collection of writings, remember what Gandhiji wrote to his general audience of readers. I would like to say, he said, to the diligent reader of my writings and to others who are interested in them, that I am not at all concerned with appearing to be consistent. <laughs> in my search for truth, I have discarded many ideas and have learned many new things. Old as I am in age, I have no feeling that I have ceased to grow inwardly or that my new growth will stop at the dissolution of the flesh. What I am concerned with is my readiness to obey the call of truth, my God, from moment to moment. And therefore, when anybody finds any inconsistency between any two writings of mine, if he still has faith in my sanity, he would do well to choose the latter of the two on the same subject. <laughs> what he wrote in his letters as well as how he signed them Tell us much about Gandhiji's personality and character. Yours faithfully, yours lovingly, yours bapu, but also humorously, yours little spinner, spider. <laughs> In May of 1930, Gandhiji was imprisoned for launching the Salt Satyagraha, the Salt March. And while at Yaravda Central Prison, which he called not a prison, but a mandir, a temple, he used his time for rest and writing and study. He wrote weekly letters to the community of workers at Sabarmati Ashram. And the letters contained descriptions and examinations of the principal ashram observances. But he also decided to translate into English the Ashram Bhajanavali, with the ashram book of prayers and hymns and devotional songs, including songs of Kabir, Mirabai, Tukaram, Surdas, to which residents of his ashrams would be familiar and using in their morning and evening worship. By December 1930, he had translated 253 of these prayer songs, and each translation was presented in a letter that he wrote to Mirabin. He explained that since the ashram was founded, not a single day had passed to his knowledge without this worship that included 
the bhajans, the ramdun, and recitations from the Gita and other sacred books every morning and every evening. He shared not only the translation of the er verses offered at the ashram prayer meetings, but along with them his own commentary on the meaning. The translation of the first prayer that he shared in these letters and later collected into the ashram Bhajanavali was early in the morning I call to mind that being which is felt in the heart, which is sat chit anandam. I am that. I am Brahman, the absolute consciousness, existence, bliss. And after writing his translation, he went on in this letter to write, the more I think, the more clearly I see the meaning. Formerly, I used to shudder to utter this verse, thinking that the claim therein was arrogant. But when I saw the meaning more clearly, I perceived at once that it was the very best thought with which to commence the day. In addition to writing to the adults of the ashrams about the ashram observances and prayers and his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, he also took time to write to the children of the ashram. And one example, one very beautiful example of such letters to the children of the ashram is the following. Little birds, dear little birds, ordinary birds cannot fly without wings. With wings, of course, all can fly. But you, without wings, will learn how to fly. Then all your troubles will indeed be at an end. And I will teach you that. See, I have no wings, yet I come flying to you every day in thought. Look, here is Vama, here is Hari, and here Dharma Kumar. And you also can come flying to me in thought. Signed, Bapu's Blessings. But often, Gandhiji's letters, beyond the personal and individual attention and to those living in the ashram, were also to larger communities of readers, as in this excerpt from his letter to every Briton. He said, whatever the ultimate fate of my country, my love for you remains and will remain undiminished. My nonviolence demands universal love, and you are not a small part of it. It is that love which has prompted my appeal to you. May God give power to every word of mine. In his name, I began to write this, and in his name, I close it. May your statesmen have the wisdom and the courage to respond to my appeal. He also wrote, in the empire of nonviolence, every true thought counts. Every true voice has its full value. Vox populi, vox dei is not a copybook maxim. It is an expression of solid experience of mankind. But it has one qualification. It is truth is confined to the field of nonviolence. Violence can for the moment completely frustrate a people's voice. But since I work on the field of nonviolence only, every true thought expressed or unexpressed counts for me. And again, he wrote in a letter to the people of Gujarat, and then he wrote in parentheses, to all of India, what should we do then? If we would see our dream, true democracy realized, we would regard the humblest and the lowest as being equally the ruler with the tallest in the land. This presupposes that all are pure or will become pure if they are not, and purity must go hand in hand with wisdom. No one would then harbor any distinction 
Everybody would regard all as equal with oneself and hold them together in the silken net of love. Everybody would know how to earn an honest living by the sweat of one's brow and make no distinction between intellectual and physical labor. Coming back to Gandhiji's bond and fellowship with both Rabindranath Tagore and Charles Freer Andrews from the Church of England, an Anglican priest. And the three of them carried out a correspondence about their hopes and concerns. Gandhiji wrote to Charlie Andrews, and this here we can see where Gandhiji shared his utmost, both his joys and his sorrows. He said, my dear Charlie, I have your letters. I prize them. They give me only partial consolation. My difficulties are deeper than you have put them. All you raise, I can answer. I must attempt in this letter to reduce my own to writing. They just now possess me to the exclusion of everything else. All the other things I seem to be doing purely mechanically. This hard thinking has told upon my physical system. I hardly want to talk to anybody. I do not even want to write anything, not even these thoughts of mine. I'm therefore falling back upon dictation to see whether I can clearly express them. I have not yet reached the bottom of my difficulties, much less have I solved them. The solution is not likely to affect my immediate work, but of the failure I can now say nothing. If my life is spared, I must reach the secret somehow. And in a letter written to Gandhiji by Tagore, the poet wrote to Mahatmaji, our people are wonderstruck at the impossible being made possible. But you know how to move the hearts of those that are obdurate and only, I'm sure, having the patient love that can conquer the hatred that has accumulated. I have no doubt that you are gaining strength and inspiring every moment strength and hope around you. I am ever yours, Rabindranath Tagore. And Gandhiji replied to, Dear Gurudev, I have your beautiful letter. I am daily seeking light. This unity is also my life's mission. The restrictions too hamper me, but I know that when I have the light, it will pierce through the restrictions. Meanwhile, I pray, though I do not yet fast. I hope you were none the worse for the strenuous work you have done in your equally fatiguing long journey. And dear Guru Drev, your precious letter is before me. You have anticipated me. I wanted to write, but my right hand needs rest. I did not want to dictate. The left hand works slow. This is merely to show you what love some of us bear towards you. I verily believe that the silent prayers from the hearts of your admirers have been heard and you are still with us. You are not a mere singer of the world. Your living word is a guide and an inspiration to thousands with deep love. Your living word. May your living word be a guide and inspiration. These are the words from Gandhiji to Tagore. Remember again, the poet's life is the poem. Our life is our message. Thank you.
This next devotional offering, Vaishnava Janito, will be sung by Samia Mahbub Ahmad with Debu Nayak on Tabla and Jackie Rockwell on Manjira. The words in Gujarati describe the saintly qualities and the divinely unfolded human nature of one who follows the path of truth. He is a real devotee who feels the suffering of others as his own, who is ever ready to serve, who is not guilty of too much pride, who bows before everyone and despises none, who preserves purity in thought, word, and deed. The bonds of desire cannot hold him ever balanced in harmony. He knows neither desire nor disappointment, neither passion nor wrath. Vaishnava Janito.
the concluding offering for our Gandhi Jayanti observance this afternoon is a sitar homage by Alif Laila with Debunaya Kontabla. It weaves in the melody of Ram Dun, set to Rag Zila Kapi. Ram Dun was traditionally offered at Gandhiji's prayer meetings in praise of the one God of all, present in all faiths, in all persons, and in all houses of worship. All worship the one supreme creator.
Thank you all very much for that beautiful concluding homage. This concludes our observance, and I thank you all for your presence and your love. Thank you.